Good to see you. Nice to be here. Nice to be here. Now, Don, you're, you're sort of, uh, you know, you have these books that you've uh, written. This yes. is a series. You call it the Afterlife series. Correct. Here's one called What Happens uh, one, one Second After We Die. Correct. And I'm going to ask you that question. Okay. You can, I'm sure you have an answer for it. You wrote a whole book on yeah, it. Yeah, I did. So. Can I see the book to see uh, what it says? Yeah, no, okay. you can't cheat. Okay. It no has cheating. to come from your okay. mind. Okay. okay. Uh, here we have one on resurrection and judgment, what awaits those who have died. And then another one living in the light of eternity, and you have some with you, not a ton with you, but no. they can get these at Amazon.com as well, yep. correct? Yes. Well, I want to talk tonight, Don, about the future. Okay. Uh, and, you know, the future in this life, and then, of course, the future in the next life. Yep. I mean, so much has happened since we talked last Incredible. time. Incredible. You know, in fact, our last conversation, was it about a year ago or maybe longer? Uh, it's about a year, I think. It yeah. was on our radio show today, A New right. Beginning. I didn't even know it was going to air today, but it happened to air. Did any of you hear it on A New Beginning? Do you listen? Good. How many of you listen to our radio show? Okay, quite a few of you. Well, Good. actually, the reason it aired today was because it was one of our top ten programs. Really? of the year. So we're sort of airing our greatest Good. hits, if you will, at the end of the year. And people really enjoyed that program. So hopefully uh, this one will be helpful to Ma people This as will well. make the cut for next year, maybe? I don't know. It okay. depends how well you do, honestly. It's really up to you. It, it takes, it, look, it, takes, the, it takes two to tango. Well, that's true. But I, I'm just kind of feeding you the questions. Okay. And you're the, right. uh, and I'll chime in here and there. But, <laughs> you know, talking about the future and all that's going on, um, C.S. Lewis, you've heard this quote before, he said, the future is something which everyone reaches at the rate of 60 minutes per hour, whatever he does, whoever he is, you know. So the future's coming. And we look at our own country right now, and we look at Islamic terrorism, mm. which, which has just gotten so bad. Every time we turn around, well, as a matter of fact, today, there was another terrorist uh, attack, only one guy walked into a police station with a meat cleaver and what looked like a suicide vest, he was killed. But, uh, and this reminds us of, of the uh, attack in Paris not that exactly. long ago, and now it's come to our shores in San Bernardino. Have you ever heard of a guy named Sebastian Gorka? He's, a, he's an expert on Islamic terrorism, and he's on a lot of the talk so. shows. But he made some interesting statements. He works very closely with the U.S. Army Command and in the intelligence community. He says that ISIS is more dangerous than any other terrorist group, including Al-Qaeda. Of course, Al-Qaeda took down the World Trade Center. Uh, he says it's the richest group of its type in human history. They have the equivalent in cash of 1,600 911s. Yeah. Their ability to recruit is mind-boggling because they're doing something that's never been done before. Al-Qaeda never did this. It's through social media. Totally. They're recruiting through social media. And there was a report on CNN that said they have the most sophisticated propaganda machine of any terrorist organization, a global communication strategy that has stumped counterterrorism officials uh, while making significant inroads among U.S. sympathizers. And this digital age helps these terrorists to do a better job of recruiting members, and they're able to do it through encrypted technology. Yeah, I know. So they can't monitor it, yeah. they can't track it. Next thing you know, you have a radicalized person. Why do you think the media is reluctant to even use the term radical Islam or Islamic terrorist? Why do they want to back away from that term? Yeah, I think there's a couple of reasons, Greg. Number one, they want to be politically correct. Yeah. They don't want to sound like they're bigots. Yeah. But number two, I think there's a fear factor, too, because if we can make nice with these people, maybe they'll like us. Maybe Iran right. won't build a bomb and blow us up. But see, they don't understand the mindset of Islam. Yeah. So they think if we're just good to them, if we're just nice to them, then they'll be nice to us. But they, un they don't understand like what ISIS is doing, what Iran is doing. Yeah. And therefore, there's this ignorance there that abounds in the Western world. It really is. Yeah. Uh, ISIS, I read an article in the paper a couple days ago. It said, uh, headline was, ISIS planning to slaughter thousands yes. in 2016. And this is interesting. They want to spark a final battle with the West. I don't think people understand what these terms mean when they read them. There's, there's a method to this madness. Uh, one expert said that they're taunting the enemy to fight the final battle. And it reminds you of what we've talked about and Joel Rosenberg, uh, who's going to be here in a couple of weeks. In fact, not this coming Sunday, but the following Sunday, right. Joel will be here. And Joel's a friend of both of us, yeah, great. a prophecy expert. The best. And lives in Israel now, as a matter of yep. fact. But, you know, he pointed out that the objective is to serve Mahdi and annihilate Judeo-Christian civilization 
and establish God's kingdom on earth known as the caliphate. So sometimes people don't know what these terms mean. Mahdi, caliphate, what is all this about? Okay, the caliphate is like a worldwide rule, Islamic rule. That is the goal of Islam. It's the goal of Sunni Islam and the goal of Shia Islam, but they're going about it two totally different yeah, ways. Yeah, define the differences okay. and who is who. All right, Iran is Shia Islam, right. okay? Right. About 10% of the Muslims of the world are Shia, 90% Sunni. The Islamic State are Sunni Muslims. They've been killing each other since the seventh century yeah. because each of them believes they're the rightful successor or heir to Muhammad. Yeah. They have two different views of end times, but bottom line is they both think they're gonna get the same place. Yeah. Islam will rule the world. Yeah, so we're talking end times here. But it's their version of end times. Correct. They, they believe in sort of final battles similar yes. to what we believe, but their Messiah is not the Lord Jesus no. Christ. Who is this Mahdi in their estimation? Will he be a physical person that would come? Yes, the 12th Imam. He's called the final right. Mahdi, the one that Allah will bring, basically to bring Islam to rule the world. And they think, for example, Iran believes they have to participate and help in this yeah. by destroying the great Satan. Of course, that's us and the little Satan, Israel. Yeah. Uh, the Islamic State has a whole different view of doing it by boots on the ground and starting with Iraq and Syria and moving out. But the bottom line is the same. They're going to have a deliverer that comes in their own final day's view, and they're going to take over the world. And is it not their belief that they want to establish almost a, a chaos uh, yes. to sort of set the scene for Mahdi to return to. So we sometimes we don't understand these acts of terrorism where yeah. they're willing to, yeah. you know, kill themselves in the process. And But actually, that's part of the plan, is it? Yeah, in fact, Iran in particular, that's one of the reasons they're working on the nuclear weapons, to bring a chaos there. They wouldn't mind, they said, if they would lose 18 million of their own people in some type of nuclear exchange, because that type of chaos, when they kill Christians and Jews, will bring this final deliver, this Mahdi, into the world. So now... The reason we're talking about this is the Bible has addressed these topics, Correct. Not, not in particular. The Bible has not specifically mentioned Islam, but there are things that the Bible has said about the end times. So looking at this scenario that we're talking about, terrorist organizations hell-bent on destroying people, committing acts of horrific violence uh, with their focus against the nation of Israel, using modern technology, are there any things that the scripture has said about this kind of activity? Oh, big time. In the last days, people's hearts will be failing them for fear. Jesus in Matthew 24 said, unless he intervenes, Greg, he said no flesh would be saved. In other words, right. he, makes the, he gives the, the view that the world is in the position where it literally could destroy itself. Yeah. And so we see right. you know, people's hearts failing them for fear and all these yeah. other signs that he gives at the end. That's right. In fact, this last, uh, at the end of, the, of this last year, 2015, uh, you know, the big concern of many people prior to the terrorist attacks was the economy. But now yes. all of a sudden yep. it's yep. terrorist uh, attacks and big fear. Time. Fear is in the air. And all it takes is just another attack and, and there's more fear, you know, and it just yep. continues on. Yep. But a, a really key passage on all of this is, of course, Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39. Right. So kind of do maybe a flyover for us. Uh, of what, what those passages are saying about the regathering of the Jewish people in their homeland, why that's significant, and then talk with us a little bit about the, this force coming against Israel, Gog, and her allies. Yeah, this is a tremendous uh, three chapters here, Greg. In chapter 37, it talks about Israel coming back to their land after being gone for a long period of time. Yeah to a land that's desolate, a land that's been destroyed by wars, and they will build it up and make it wealthy, wealthy to the place yeah. that in Ezekiel, they will come back now in the last days. Yeah. Ezekiel 38 and 39 says, these countries that will invade, seven or eight, depend how you divide them up, yeah. because Israel has something not only they want, but something that they need. And they will attack from all four sides, and then the God, God gets them when they get into the promised land. That's when he destroys them. So Ezekiel 38 and 39 talks about this huge battle that's going to, well, not much of a battle. I mean, they invade, but God wipes them out as soon yeah. as they get there. They start killing one another. So it's predicting in the last days, in fact, one verse says twice, the last days, the latter times, yeah. these armies will come north, south, east, and west to attack this little tiny nation, yeah. Israel. Israel is so small that on the map of the Middle East, you can't even write the name in the, in the country. You have <laughs> sure. to write it out in the Mediterranean. Mediterranean yeah, Sea. It doesn't, yeah. Literally, it doesn't fit. Yeah. And yet you've got millions of square miles yeah. from these other nations coming down because this little tiny nation 
has something they want, something they need in the last days. And we've seen it happen exactly as the Bible predicted. The Israelis came back to the land, yeah. form a modern state in 1948. Yeah. They've been growing. They've got tremendous wealth. And we've got some possibility of even greater wealth. And so... What these, do you mean by that? Uh, it was just October 7, just a couple of months ago, the announcement was made that in the Golan Heights, an oil reserve was found hmm. that literally could sustain Israel for centuries, it was said. Really? Yeah. Usually it talks about the, 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 the oil there, the, 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 the depth of it is like 35 meters deep. Yeah. They said this one's possibly 350 meters deep, a third of the Golan Heights with possibly billions of dollars worth of oil there to be yeah. extracted. Now, what's interesting about this, the Golan Heights are in an area that's disputed. It was Syrian territory until 1967, right. and now it's Israeli territory. Yeah. Syri Syrians still claim it. And who is right there working with Syria? Iran and Russia, who are yeah. part of the invading force, according to Ezekiel 38, right there in the country of Syria, fighting for Syria in That's a right. land that uh, they say is theirs. And this is a very recent development. From just because recently. here is Ezekiel. Uh, how many years ago was Ezekiel? About 2,600. 2,600 years ago, here's this Hebrew prophet talking about this force called Gog marching on Israel uh, who've been scattered, regathered, and then he goes out on the limb of all times and says one of her allies is Persia. Right. Now, of course, Iran, was it 1935? 35. They changed their name to mm -hmm. Iran. So, I mean, this... This, I mean, we can say that we believe Russia is Gog, right. and maybe it is. I think you can make a pretty good case well, for that. Well, Gog is the leader, right? right? From the land of Magog, Russia would be Rosh there. Yeah. And Rosh is a proper right. noun. Talk about the nation of the far north of Israel. Yep. Right. So, and her ally is Persia. Correct. And Iran. And so this alliance that has been coming together in the last few years, but really now with the meltdown of Syria... And, and now we have, uh, you know, Russia aligning herself with Syria. We're seeing this, uh, you know, come to pass right in front of our eyes. Now, here's the thing that's so amazing. Yeah. This is incredible because we always knew, according to Ezekiel 38, there would be this last day's invasion. But see, Russia and Iran are a long way away from Israel. Yeah. And to do an invasion, Greg, you know, satellite technology, you're going to see when they gather together, it'd be something that you could right. prepare for. Now they're on the Syrian-Israeli border. They're about 140 miles from Israel in yeah. Syria. They're already there. They've got in both Syria and Iran four different military bases. Uh, Russia had the largest submarine in the world parked outside of the Syrian coast with 120 nuclear weapons on it. They've got missiles, uh, Tomahawk missiles that can shoot tactical, uh, conventional weapons or tactical nuclear weapons right now. And Iran is there also with some of its most elite troops. So they're right there on the Israeli border right now. So they're knocking at the door, literally. And here in this strange alignment, uh, we are, in a way, aligned with Iran. Yes. And we have never been further in uh, diplomatic relations with Israel than we are at the moment. Yeah. And so what a strange thing where we're actually releasing billions of dollars to Iran, trusting their word. When I read an article the other day where it said that uh, th they're already ramping up their missile program. They've already violated this treaty, but we're not doing anything to enforce it. And they've made no uh, secret about their desire to wipe Israel out. Still, exactly. And yet we do nothing except turn our back on that. And we're a laughing stock in the Middle East. We're a paper tiger. But see, this is predicted in Scripture. Right. One of the signs of the end is there's no superpower who can That's or true. will help Israel. True. Because Israel has no one to help them, none whatsoever. And that means the U.S. has to go down in power. It's exactly what we see. It's almost like we're there, but we're not quite yeah, there. Yeah. But it's like you can see how yep. close we are right. to that scenario that wouldn't even seem that believable maybe you know, 10 years ago, because we've always been such a staunch ally of Israel. Yeah, we have. But uh, in the last few years, Greg, it's really changed, and it's really sad, because as we as we go towards Israel, so does the United States go down. And we've been down morally, economically, spiritually, yeah. militarily. In the last seven, eight years, it's been horrible. Why should the United States stand by the nation Israel? Okay, a couple reasons. Number one, they're the only democracy in the Middle East, yeah. uh, number one. Sure. Number two, you know, our heritage is there, a judeo Christian ethic. We, you yeah. know, our religion, our Jesus Christ came from Israel, our, yeah. our, the Ten Commandments, you know, which is the basis yeah. of, you know, of everything that here we have in the Western world. So Israel has a very special place in our heart. Plus the fact, you know, we know in God's program, they have a, yeah. they have a place in the end times. Yeah. Big time. They do. And there's a blessing there, isn't there? Big blessing. Bless those that bless, curse those that curse. Genesis. That was given to Abraham and his descendants. Yep. So I don't think it's a stretch for us to say 
as we stand by the nation of Israel, the Jewish homeland, that there's a blessing on our country for it. I think yeah. one of the reasons God has blessed the United States is because we have stood by Israel. Totally. Genesis 12, 1 to 3 is still and it still applies. I'll bless those that bless, I'll curse those that curse. That's right. And it's still, still true today. Look at the nations of the world that have tried to eradicate the Jewish people. <laughs> they sit on the ash heap of history. You know, you can go back to uh, Babylon, you can look at Egypt, you can look at Rome, others that tried to eradicate the Jews, Germany more recently, yep. and, and you know, that the, they really did face a certain judgment for that. Yeah, exactly. We think of the, the, the people in biblical times. Yeah. When's the last time you saw an Edomite? That's true. A Moabite? Yeah. Amorite? That's Termite? True. Well, I've seen those, okay, yeah. but you know, but they're, but they're not there anymore yeah. because they made the mistake of attempting to eradicate Israel, and God said, I'm going to curse those that curse. They are not around today. But what's interesting, Greg, the Bible assumes at the end of time, there's still a nation of Israel that exists in the, in the, in the last days, right. functioning as a political entity, and it's exactly what we see. That's right. You guys tracking with this? Is this boring yet? Okay, okay. okay. better not be. All right. Okay, now here's some new developments that just in the last few days. Uh, we have a conflict now between Saudi Arabia yes. and Iran. News articles said a conflict has been raging for days between the Shiite Muslim power, Iran, the Sunni kingdom, since Saudi Arabia executed cleric uh, Namar el namar I don't know if I'm pronouncing that properly, but this was a big deal to the Iranians. Do you know anything about this guy and what's yeah, going yeah, on with this? Yeah, he was a very outspoken a critic there of the Saudi government. He was in Saudi Arabia. He was a political activist. Yeah. Uh, Saudi Arabia is, is, you know, Sunni Muslim, but they have, yeah. they have Shias there. Yeah. And he was just fomenting, you know, the, the, the people there, and they threatened for years to execute him, and Iran thought, no, they'll never do it. And the yeah. Saudis felt strong enough, well, we can do it, you know, because they're yeah. the two big dogs fighting for the yeah. Middle East there, Saudi Arabia right. and Iran, so they did it, and literally it's caused all sorts of problems because people are now dividing up the countries on one side or the other. So this is huge because, according to Ezekiel 38, you got two things going on. you got an invasion that yeah. Iran and Russia are part right. of, That's right. and you got people sitting on the sidelines, which right. Saudi Arabia is part of. The Bible predicts that. And now, if this isn't bad enough, we have North Korea <laughs> firing <laughs> yeah. off. Now, they said it yep. was a hydrogen bomb, but yep. now since our government has said it wasn't a hydrogen bomb, well, listen, it was a big bomb. It was a big it bomb. It was some kind of a nuclear weapon yeah, because yeah. it caused a 5.1 uh, magnitude earthquake. Big time. So, I mean, and, you know, these guys are, are developing, you know, uh, interballistic missiles, uh, obviously, to move these weapons, and they've threatened us before. <laughs> Is there any kind of an alliance or relationship between North Korea and Iran? Big time. They've been helping other sharing technology back and forth, and there's a, right. there's a very close connection there, Greg, because remember in the Clinton administration with Madeleine Albright, we made an agreement with North Korea which they wouldn't develop nuclear weapons. We have peace in our time, and everything's right. going to be fine. Right. And yet now we're a couple decades later, and they've gone back on it. Because we think these sanctions, or the sanctions have yep. been lifted, but now these sort of restrictions that we're holding the Iranians to, will keep them from getting a nuclear weapon. Yet at the same time, the North Koreans have been sending, you know, advisors over there oh, to yes. Iran. They could basically sell them a nuke of or course. give it to them if they wanted to. And here's a nation that is very, in a very outspoken way, said they want to eradicate Israel. The Ayatollah said, Israel must be annihilated. Yep. He tweeted that. Oh, yeah, yeah. What kind of a tweet is that, you know? A bad one. Yeah. That's not a good one. But it's yep. true to yep. form, yep. and it shows where they're at. Okay, so I think when we talk about things like this, people sometimes can't see the forest for the trees. So let's try to kind of put it together. Sure. It's like a puzzle. You know, we put totally. all the pieces on the table, and we're trying to figure out what fits where. So let's maybe establish sort of a timeline here. Okay. Okay, so we're talking about... Uh, Israel's regathered in the land. That's right. been fulfilled. We read about this uh, force from the north coming with their allies and attacking her. That's still in the future. We know Antichrist is going to eventually emerge. We know there's going to be a one world government, a cashless society. And we also know somewhere in the mix there's going to be a rapture. Yes. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. But maybe just give us a, a bird's eye view or a flyover of the order of the events as you best see them. Okay, as we best see them. The first would be the rapture of the church. Yeah. The Lord would take the church out. You like that idea first? Yeah. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and here's the good news. That can happen any moment, yeah. any time. He takes us out. Two things happen. Rapture means to catch up 
harpazo yeah. in Greek, it's the rapere is the Latin right. word we get rapture from. As we're caught up, we are changed. The living believers, the dead in Christ rise first, yeah. and the body of Christ is complete. After that, a number of things happen. Yeah. A period called the Great Tribulation, yeah. where the 70th week of Daniel takes yeah. place, and probably one of the first events will be this Ezekiel 38, 39 invasion. And then... Let's just slow down for a okay. second. Great Tribulation period. Okay. Antichrist emerges on the scene. Oh, he's coming after that. He's coming as a, yeah, he's coming first as a man of peace. Though. Yeah, so that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. Because as the tribulation starts, if you don't know your Bible and you haven't been raptured, yeah. you might think this is a good guy. Well, he's, he's, yeah, he's the best. Because in Revelation, he's riding a white horse. Yes. He's Man sort of, in, you know, because anti is against, but also instead of, he's a false Christ. Totally. He's going to help the Jews rebuild their temple. Right. But then something happens called the abomination of desolation. What's that? Yeah, that's when it changes. That's the last three and a half period, yeah. year period begins, called the Great Tribulation, Matthew right. 24, 21. And Jesus said, if he didn't return, there'd yeah. be no flesh saved. Right. That's where the temple will be rebuilt, sacrifices yeah. offered. Right. This man comes, stops the sacrifices, puts idols of himself in the Holy of Holies, right. declares open season on the Jews, and then claims to be God himself that's and right. forces people to worship him as God. Yeah, so we've got... Okay, rapture of the church. We've got uh, Antichrist emerging as a man of peace. We have the tribulation period in play. Now, um, what else happens in the tribulation period? Well, this tremendous judgment, 6 through 19, where the right. wrath of God is poured out on the face of the earth. And you read some of these judgments, if they're literal, and we believe they are, you know, yeah. like a third of the humanity is destroyed by some right. of these judgments. God right. pouring his wrath out is something really, really horrendous. Yeah. The good news is, Christ comes back at the end of it to set up his kingdom as king of kings and lord of lords. But during this period, yeah. great revival happens because sure. people will wake up. Uh, they're called the tribulation saints right. because they'll see that what we've been saying all this That's time right. is true. A lot of them think we're nuts right now, but when we're gone, they'll, they'll, they'll wake up. Yeah, and there's 144,000. They're Jehovah's Witnesses, right? That's right. 12,000 yeah. of each Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> no, they Where's are not. Where's that lightsaber again? We need to do this. Yeah. No, 12, yeah, 12, Who are the 144,000? Uh, 12, Revelation 7, 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes right. of Israel. You've got, they will be witnessing for the Lord. All right. Yeah. You've got also, according to Revelation 11, two witnesses, yes. uh, like possibly Moses and Elijah that yeah. will come. Is that for, who you think they are? Uh, Elijah's probably one of them. Moses, good, good. We don't yeah. know. Or it could be just Because they have the power to... Uh, you call fire down from heaven. Yep. That's an Elijah like miracle. Elijah and, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyway. So you got the 144,000, yeah. the two witnesses. Then in Revelation 14, 6, to top it off, an angel flies all around the world That's preaching right. the everlasting gospel in every language, telling people it's time to repent because the yeah. end is near. So God, there's not going to be anybody who's ignorant. Yeah. Right? Everybody's going to know what the score is at that time. It's like an angelic mop-up operation. Indeed it is. Big I'm going to put one drop in my eye because I'm wearing a contact lens. Okay, no problem feel much better. Okay, so we've got the tribulation period in full force. Right. We've got the 144,000 who are actually protected by God totally. until their yeah. job is done. Exactly. We've got the angelic mop-up operation proclaiming the everlasting gospel. And then it's building and we read about the battle of Armageddon. Yep. Is there a battle singular or yep. are there battles of Armageddon yeah. and why is it called Armageddon? Yeah, okay. Armageddon is Hebrew for the mountain of Megiddo. And yeah. Megiddo is, of course, you know, a mountain there in Israel, yes. an ancient tell or a mound that has something like 26 civilizations built one on top of another. You've got a valley there. This is the most lush valley you've ever seen right yeah. now, the Valley of Esdraelon, where that's where the battle will be fought. Many battles were fought there in the past. Yeah. Deborah, the judge, true. fought one. Napoleon fought one there. That's true. But in, in Armageddon there. And he said it was one of the finest yeah. battlefields he'd ever seen. Ex and exactly. And it's a tr if you, when you're there, you've been there. You know, we, you look at it, you can, no. you can almost visualize it all happening right there. But it'll happen. It's going to be a campaign where all these armies come together. And that's when the Lord will intervene and uh, wipe out the armies of the Antichrist and uh, come back. Okay, so we've been raptured. Right. So what goes up must come down. Definitely. So we're coming with Christ at the second coming. We sure are. And, uh, w and the second coming is, is the is at the end of the tribulation period, right. and it's different from the rapture, yes, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yet people get confused about the two. Yeah, because the Lord comes for his church, yes. the rapture comes with his church at the second coming. Right. And the rapture, it's every time the rapture is mentioned in scripture, it's always a blessing. It's always it something is. joyful. Yes. Every time he talks about the second coming, it's in true. judgment. And That's so you've true. got two totally distinct events. And so now the church returns with Christ, and what follows this now? 
Uh, when the church returns with Christ, there's the judgment of the nations, Matthew yeah. chapter 25, verse about yeah. 31 and following. Right. The nations are judged. Those who are still alive, all right, will be judged, and the Lord will separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep are the ones that enter the kingdom of God, the yes. millennial kingdom. Millennium is Latin for a thousand, thousand year reign of Christ on right. earth. The goats will be taken away to judgment. So there will be people alive believers and unbelievers when the Lord comes back with the church, not us, because we're already caught up, but we're, we've been changed yeah. at this time. So that's the future there when he comes back the second time, puts his foot on the Mount of Olives, it splits in two, and uh, he's back on earth. So that's the millennium. Correct. And then at the end of the millennium, which the word millennium means a thousand, right, isn't correct. it? So it's a thousand year reign of Christ. Mm -hmm. That's where the wolf is with the lamb and the, and the little child leads them and so forth. And Christ rules, but there's non-believers who, the descendants of the descendants yeah. of survivors, I suppose, of the tribulation that were ruling over in the millennium. Exactly. And unbelievably, with Christ himself ruling, there's still a final rebellion at the end of the millennium. Yeah, there's another battle of Gog. Uh, yeah. Gog is a title, and there's a rebellion there, and a great number of people will follow this Gog and will fight, and Satan is loose too, to, yes. to gather the people together, and it's one final battle, and after that, the Lord wipes them out. You've got the great white throne judgment, the last judgment. Yeah. Those whose names are not written in the book of life are thrown in the lake of fire. Yeah. Then eternity begins, new heaven and new earth. And like they say, we live happily ever, ever after, forever and ever and ever That's in true. the presence of the King. Isn't that great? That's right. Amen. Now, Don, there's different views on the rapture. For starters, yeah. some don't even believe in the rapture. Right. I put a little phone number. In fact, I think that number's on the screen maybe. Uh, that people can text. Uh, yeah, you see that right there? If you text that number right now, uh, I may get it here on my screen and completely ignore it. No, I'll, I keep my <laughs> eye on my screen and I may read your question. So if you have a question, text it to the number on the screen. It'll pop up here on this uh, iPad. But um, one person asked a little bit earlier, is there a rapture? I don't clearly see in the Bible that indicates that. It seems as though we're seeing signs that we're going to go through the tribulation as Christians. And so uh, why, what would your response be to this person about is there a rapture and then what about going through the tribulation period as a Christian? All right, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, uses the word rapture there yeah. in Latin, not in English, but uh, we will be caught up, caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Let's take it through 1 Thessalonians. The first letter that Paul wrote, verse 10 of chapter one, we're waiting for the Lord from heaven who will deliver us from the wrath to come, the yes. coming wrath. How is he gonna deliver us? 1 Thessalonians 4, yeah. 13 through 18, the rapture of the church, taking yeah. us out. And then 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, he said, he's not appointed us to wrath, right. but to salvation through Jesus Christ, or deliverance. So the rapture of the church is based on what the scripture has to say. The word is there in scripture, it's a biblical word. Yeah. But what we find in a number of places, now there's not one verse that says it one way or another, but yeah. when you put the pa passages of scripture together, we're not there because this period of time, Greg, is the wrath of God on the yes. face of the earth. It's not persecution of Christians. It's God's wrath to an unbelieving yeah. world. And you don't really have an instance in scripture when God poured his judgment out, where he poured it out on his people. A case in point, yeah. when the judgment of the earth came through water in the days yeah. of Noah, he got Noah and his ark. family in the ark safely out. And in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, with the case of Lot and his family, he had them get out of the city Correct. before the judgment came down, kind of underscoring that point you made of God has not appointed us to wrath. But some will say, yes, but you know, the Bible, Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. But there's a difference oh, between yeah. personal tribulation yes. that Christians do go through and the great tribulation yeah. Uh, period. Yeah, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. In other words, the time Israel will have, it's the most difficult time in their history. Also, the 70th week of Daniel yeah. and, of course, the great tribulation. And like Jesus said, unless he returns, yeah. humanity would destroy itself. But fortunately, he returns before that happens. Here's a good question. Just came in. Why is everyone trying to destroy Israel? Ah, great question. Yes. Uh, it's something. Who, who asked that question? Raise your hand up. 30 hands. They might, be, yeah. they might be. Uh, it's over there. Okay, Very good. good. Great question. Yeah. Okay, move to the front of the class. Okay. <laughs> any, anyway, you know, this is something supernatural. Why yeah. do people hate Israel? Why do they hate the Jews? Because God chose them as the chosen people to, yeah. to get his word to the world. And see, if the enemy could wipe out Israel, then God's promises would not be fulfilled. If Israel mm -hmm. ceases to exist, then God's promises to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob would be no good. So the enemy from day one, Greg, has tried to wipe out the nation Israel. And yeah. so there's a supernatural holy hatred for Israel. Yeah. In fact, the Bible says, sign 14 of my 14 signs of the end, is Israel would be on its own at the last days all by itself. 
and that's what we're seeing right now, being isolated from the world. The whole world will be basically against it. What is the term preterist? What is a preterist? Because some will say, yeah. well, these events have already happened. Yeah. They were all fulfilled already, and we shouldn't be looking to the future for the fulfillment of these events. Yeah, preterist is the Latin word for past, meaning the events, most of the events in the book of Revelation were fulfilled in AD 70 with the destruction of yeah. Jerusalem. Yeah. They're fulfilled in the past. What Jesus was talking about yeah. was not his second coming literally to the earth, right. but the destruction of Jerusalem. And so they think the book of Revelation was all fulfilled by the year AD 70. And, um, you know, except, of course, someone will give the second coming of Christ is still in the future, but it's one view of Scripture, the right. preterist point of view. And we don't hold that. No, we view. don't. No, we think it's a problem. Here's another good question uh, that just popped up. Uh, can you be saved if you're left behind? So let's say there's a person, they've heard the gospel, mm -hmm. they've rejected it, and all of their Christian friends disappear, yep. and they realize, oh man, it's all true. Now they're in the tribulation. Right. Now, of course, it's the beginning, and we have a peaceful entry, so-called, of the Antichrist, but we know bad things are coming. Can you still be saved during the tribulation period? Yes, you can, yes. but if you're listening, you don't want to. You yeah. want to be saved now. Right. You can be, theoretically, but please don't yeah. do that. Um, there'll be a great revival that happens, but, yes. the, but the Bible says, interesting, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, there'll be a strong delusion that is That's sent right. to people who take pleasure in wickedness, yeah. and they, no matter what happens, they won't believe. But there's others who will come to their senses, but it's not something you want to do because it's a, the, the darkest time in the history of Earth. You don't want to be around at that time. And the good news is, Greg, today, nobody has to That's if right. they come to faith in Christ. Here's an often asked question. Will all children be raptured? Uh, will all children be raptured? Children of believers, yes. Children of unbelievers, we're not told. We don't know. Why, okay, why would you say that the child of a believer would be raptured and the child of a believer, you're not saying they won't be, we're saying we don't know, but why, why would you say the child of a Christian would be raptured and the child of a non-Christian perhaps we would not be raptured? Because 1 Corinthians chapter, what is it, 9? Uh, yeah. Is, yeah, it tells us that in some sense, the belie the, yeah. anybody who's a believer in the family sanctifies or sets apart the other members of the family, right. and that would include the children. But think of it this way, Greg. Yeah. The rapture is the blessed hope. Yeah. What blessed hope would there be if you got caught up and your child was left behind? That yeah. wouldn't be something to look no. forward to. So in some sense, we sanctify or set apart our children by believing in Christ. Okay, we did this before, but it, it helps people to kind of wrap their mind around it. We'll do a lightning round. Okay, just haven't we me... been doing one? I... What's that? Just kidding. kidding. What did you say? I said, haven't we been doing one so far? A lightning round? Was this too fast for you? No, not, it's not fast enough, actually. It's... Get that lightsaber. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lightsaber round. It's a lightsaber round. Yes. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so okay. just like maybe okay. two yeah. like two sentence explanations okay. of these terms. Sure. Rapture of the church. It's the catching up of believers who are alive on the earth. Okay, tribulation period. Uh, a seven-year period divided into two parts. The, the last part called the Great Tribulation. The Antichrist. He is a person in place of or instead of Christ, a human being, a Gentile from the old Roman Empire. The false prophet. He was like his uh, John the Baptist, probably Jewish. He performed signs and wonders calling people to worship this final Antichrist. The Battle of Armageddon. It's a campaign that it's at the end of time there in the Valley of uh, Megiddo in the nation of Israel, plain of Israelin, where all the armies of the world at that time will gather together for one final battle. The 144,000. 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Revelation 7 and 11. In and out burger. It's the place, what's the hamburger's all about? Okay. Very, very well, good. Well, well, yeah. That's what a hamburger's all about. It is. It, yeah, sorry. You get an A, Don Stewart. Thank you, Greg Laurie. I you agree. know, we were in class today, uh, as kids, you know, I would be the guy in the back of the room making jokes, being sent to the vice principal's office, and you would have been in the front of the room as a teacher's assistant. Oh, I don't know about that. Well, I, I, got, I got in some trouble, too. Before did I, you? Oh, yeah. You did? You got in trouble? Mm-hmm. I was what a kind smart of trouble? aleck. A smart aleck? Before I came I to the Lord. I can see that. You can? Me? No, I, before I came to Christ, yeah, I really was. I was and I was an athlete, you too. You still are a little bit, too. Quite a bit, actually. Yeah. As am I. Uh, well, yeah, like we said the other day to each other, quirky minds think alike, right? Yes. We came up with the same thing independently. It's interesting on a whole yeah. other issue. It was funny. Okay, so let's shift gears now and okay. move from the prophetic events just to the afterlife in okay. general. Uh, in your book, Living in the Light of Eternity, you talk about the value of talking about death. And, you know, it's interesting in our culture today, it seems like this is a topic we avoid. You know, in the past, in other cultures, Death would be talked about more openly. Yes. In fact, uh, ancient merchants would write the words memento mori, 
uh, over a document. It could be an accounting document, and it just meant think of death. Like, hey, uh, reality, death will come eventually, so yeah. just remember this. But in our culture today, we don't want to talk about it anymore. But actually, in uh, your book, um, Living in the Light of Eternity, you make some really good points, and so I'd like you to sort of elaborate on these. Okay. Uh, you talk about why it's important to talk about the afterlife. And it, this doesn't have to be a morbid subject, does no, it? No, no, because we're all going there. These bodies yeah. aren't made to last forever. Sooner right. or later, we're going to be face-to-face -face with the Lord. It'd be nice to know where we're going, and we can know. So it's a subject the Bible says so much about, and we need to know about it. Yes. Okay, so here's some points you make. Uh, studying the afterlife will help us to maintain the proper perspective in this life. Correct. Elaborate on that. Okay. And this life is not all that there is. We yeah. live with eternity's values in view. In other words, we think about eternity when we do things here on earth. Yeah. First Timothy 6 says we can't take it with us. We come into the world with nothing. We live with nothing. So we have eternity in our minds at all times. So thinking about the afterlife helps us to live right down here in this life. Yes. I think it was uh, C.S. Lewis who said something along the lines, loose paraphrase, those that think the most of the next life do the most in this one. Yep. You know, the idea of, you know, Christians are always the ones that are the first ones to respond whenever there's a crisis always. or a calamity. Because people will say, oh, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. Nonsense. Not at all. Those that are the most heavenly minded are the greatest yes, earthly good. Yep. Uh, Here's another thing you say. It gives us a motivation for godly living. Yeah, it does, because we're going to meet the Lord face to face someday, yeah. and he's going to judge us. He's going to evaluate us and reward us based on how faithful we've been after we've come to Christ. So there's a, there's a reason, you know, there's a motivation we have to live godly because we know this life isn't all that there is. When we close our eyes in death, we will wake up in the presence of the Lord. So we know yeah. we are going, death just leads to a destination. Yeah. So it, it motivates us to live godly in this life. And that you could also apply that to your belief in the imminent return of Christ. Because Correct. some would say, it doesn't really matter if you believe in the soon return of Jesus or not. Well, actually, it does. Uh, Jesus yeah. talks about the wicked servant who says, my Lord delays his coming. And then John tells us, he that has this hope, that is of the return of Christ, purifies himself. Yeah. So not only believing eternity is close, but knowing that Christ could come back. Exactly. We want to be living a godly life. Yeah, definitely. Okay, you also say it will give us great comfort and encouragement when believers die. This is very important. It, it is because we've all been touched by it, by yes. having believers, or at least most of us have, that having people that we know we love pass away. Yeah. We know if they're in Christ. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4.18, comfort one another with these words. Because right. he talks about a great reunion we're going to have someday. Right. And so when a believer dies, the word's never goodbye. We'll see you later. See you sometime in the future. And it's yeah. so practical, Greg, because death is, hurts. is a loss. Yeah. It's, we mourn for it, but we yeah. don't mourn as those that have no hope. And that's what Paul said. Yeah. You know, Don, if it wasn't for the, the hope of uh, what we find in Scripture, I don't know how I would have survived yeah. mm. having my son die. Know. It, it, you know, it still to this day is still very painful for me. And I miss him with all of my heart. But, you know, as uh, Paul says, we don't grieve hopelessly as those that have no hope. So we still grieve as Christians, but it's hopeful mm. grieving. You can be sad and have hope simultaneously. Indeed. And it's a... Go ahead. And no, it's a, it's a real hope, a genuine yeah. hope. It's not something false that we've talked ourselves into. That's the good news based on what Christ has done for us. And remembering the Lord could come back at any time and also eternity's close. Mm -hmm. You said we'll give believers compassion for those who are lost. Uh, big time because you see people lost. Remember Jesus when he saw the multitudes, they were cast down yeah. like a sheep without a shepherd. Yeah. I know that's how you see it, your evangelistic crusades. Yeah. You're praying that you see people out there that have no direction, they're yes. lost. And we have the message in our hand that gives them that's hope, it. that gives us direction. That's why we're doing, you know, this big yeah. event, Harvest yeah. America, on March 6th uh, at AT&T at &T Stadium. It's the biggest thing we've under ever undertaken. But we just believe that the Lord is coming back. We believe life is short, and we want to reach as many people as we can with the message of the gospel. And, and we all need that urgency in our lives, don't we? Do we? we do indeed. Yeah. Amen. I like this point. Yeah. This is a good point, Don. You said, we realize that justice will eventually be done in the universe. You know, uh, people believe in hell. They just believe it's for someone else, never for them. But there is a sense in, in many people, maybe most people, that there's not justice in this life. There are things that happen that are wrong. Yep. 
unjust things, but there's a final chord, isn't there? That's the wonderful thing. In fact, that's one of the most appealing things about it. Someday, all the wrongs will be made right. right. Someday, the things that were never found out will be found out, and God will make it right. right. And those that have been wronged will be, you know, will be straightened out. It's wonderful. Yeah, and there's also rewards for Christians, aren't big time. there? Yeah. Well, that's it. Oh, big time. What? Say something about well, it. Well, it's a big. Oh, well. How much do you want me to say? Okay. Well. Okay. okay. We're going to get. Okay. Let's go back to heaven for a moment. Okay. Oh, we have the rapture. We're in heaven. There's the judgment seat of Christ. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Also called the bema seat. B correct. So, and sometimes people might confuse this with the great white throne judgment, which no. is very different. Exactly. So, talk about that judgment seat of Christ and the giving out of rewards to Christians in heaven. Okay. Look at it this way. The bema seat was a raised platform. It was mm -hmm. used in the Olympic Games in, in Athens in the first century to give out rewards like yeah. gold, silver, bronze, medals. Yeah. So the person that came in first got a gold medal. The person yeah. that came in second wasn't hung. They were given a silver medal and the yeah. third a bronze medal. Yeah. And so at the Bema seat of Christ, Christians will be rewarded based on how faithful we've been yes. to the commandments of Christ after the time we've come to know him. And so to believers, judgment day is reward day. Yes. We will be judged in the sense of rewards unbelievers will be judged in the sense of being condemned. And so for us, all we're looking forward to is hopefully building our foundation on gold, silver, precious stones, yeah. as 1 Corinthians 3 says, we will be rewarded on how faithful we've been to what the Lord's put in front of us. So the judgment seat of Christ is really almost like an award ceremony. Big time. Where the, but the great white throne judgment, oh, no, no, no. if you end up there and they open up the books and then the book of life yep. is open and your name is not found written there, is there a way out of that? Can you talk no. God out of this? No. Is, is that it? That's the sad thing, Greg. The, the unbelievers are thrown in the lake of fire, and that is the final judgment, the final resting place, or as it were, of the wicked. It's a horrific thought to think of, but this is what the Lord says. The lake of fire, according to Matthew 25, 41, was prepared for the devil and his angels, right. Jesus said. Yeah. But unfortunately, humans will go there by not accepting Christ. Of course, immediately some people are going to say, well, how could a God of love create a place called hell? And how could a God of love send people to hell? What would you yep. say to that? Well, God sends no one to hell. People send themselves there. The God, the God of love has died in their place and they don't have to go there. He's taken their game, guilt, their shame, their penalty on himself so they can go to and be with the Lord. Yeah. Uh, if people reject that, since we've been made, here's the thing, we've been made for eternity. Each right. of us, all of us, either with God or without him. We're not going to disappear. We're not going to you know, vanish. We're not going to be annihilated. So we're going to have to go somewhere. If we don't go to heaven, there's only one other place, yeah. and that's the judgment, the lake of fire. Do you think life and death are, are in the hands of God? Totally. And, and do you think that there's an appointed day for us to die? Yes, but we don't know it. The Lord knows it. He yeah. hadn't told us. Yeah, I think so. Because it seems to be that way, that there is an appointed time. We, you know, He knows when it is, obviously. Uh, we don't, but that's why we have to live each day as though it were our last. In fact, right. one of the great preachers, John Wesley, said to young preachers, he said, preach every sermon as though it will be your last, and one day you'll be right. And so we need to live every day as though it were our last, and one day we'll be correct. That's right. Uh, you have this book here, What Happens One Second After We Die. Yep. So what does happen for the Christian one second after they die. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, absent from the body, at home with the Lord. Immediately we're in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and we'll be there forever and ever and ever. That's initially what happens when we come to Christ. So when a Christian dies, they're obviously their body yeah. goes into the ground, the ground, but then their soul goes into heaven mm -hmm. and they're with Jesus. Now when they get up there, do uh, we know we're going to get our uh, resurrected body later. Yeah. But what, is there an intermediate body or what? So there's three views. Some people argue for an intermediate body. Mm -hmm. Some people believe the glorified bodies there at, the, at you know, yeah. immediate upon death. I think the best view is we are, we are spirits, disembodied spirits. Remember, angels are spirits. They don't have any physical form. God is spirit. They do well in the, in the unseen realm. Thank you. And so we will too. So we'll be spirits, but we'll have, it'll be us. We'll be alive in a sense. We're cognizant. It's, we're there but we will be in some type of temporary form because intermediate means in between state, in between yeah. this life and in between then the resurrection and yeah. the judgment. Uh, one person asked this question, my father died years ago from his life's testimony, he went to heaven. If that's true, 
Is he in the ground dead waiting to meet Jesus or in the air or did he go to heaven immediately after death? When we die, do we go to heaven or just stay in the grave? Everybody that dies from day one, the moment they die as a believer is immediately in the presence of the Lord. He is in heaven. He's been in heaven. He's rejoicing in heaven. Body in the ground, yes. yes. Spirit, the real hymns in heaven. And someday there's going to be a reunion of the two, the resurrection of the dead, when the body and spirit join together. And that's what happens at the time of the rapture of the church. That happens first. Then the living believers caught up to meet the Lord in the air. You know, it's an interesting phrase we find used often in Scripture about death for the believer, and this is only for the believer, is it's they fell asleep. Yeah. You think about Stephen, the first martyr of the church. He died a violent death. Totally. He was stoned for his bold Mm -hmm. preaching. And and as he's there dying, of course, he looked into heaven, and what did he see? He saw... He says, I see the heavens are open and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. But then what I find amazing about that story, it says, he fell asleep. Mm -hmm. Interesting, he died a violent death, yet he fell asleep. What is that phrase? Why do you think that phrase is used? fell asleep because the bible talks about those who are in the presence of the lord are at rest their souls are at rest he's now at rest the labors on this earth are now over no more persecution no more pain the body ceases to function he's now at rest in god's presence so in a sense his body fell asleep but his spirit was never more alive than that time you know i don't know about you don but as i get older i like falling asleep I'm, I'm doing it more and more, too. I act, uh, uh, you find out the same thing? I like thing? naps. I do, too. Not long naps. Just short naps. Of course. Ten minutes all you need. Yeah. yeah. Ma- not even that long. Eight but minutes. Okay. I mean, I know. a little short nap it helps. You. So, you know the idea. You know, when you're a little kid and your parents would say, go take a nap. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Then when you're older and your wife says, go take a nap. Yeah. Yeah. Short nap, though. So, we fall asleep. But, okay, then some will take from that idea, this idea of soul sleep. Yeah. What is soul sleep and why is that not biblical? Yeah, it, it's, some people call it soul extinction. In other words, mm-hmm. when you die, you don't, don't exist anymore, and then God recreates the soul the moment you, um, you know, at the resurrection of the dead. But the Bible talks about sleep in the sense that, you know, it's, the body it looks like it's sleep. It ceases to function, you know, when you're asleep. But the idea of sleep is someday you'll wake up. But Scripture says the body stops functioning, but the spirit is alive with the yeah. Lord again. Absent from the body, at yeah. home with the Lord. Jesus told the criminal next to him on the cross, today right. you'll be with me in paradise, even though his body was going to be dying soon. What about the teaching of purgatory? Well, what is it and why is it not biblical? Yeah, a number of reasons. Purgatory is a kind of halfway place between earth and heaven. Sort of like Barstow? Some... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're in the middle you, of two you, you, places. You've been there too. Huh? In between. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah in, sorry, from Barstow. No, just kidding. An on eternal that. stopover. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the purgatory, <laughs> purgatory is a, a non-existent place yeah. that was invented by the Roman Catholic Church yeah. as a place to get people prepared for heaven. In other words, they're not bad enough for hell, but not good enough for heaven, but yeah. they're on their way to heaven, so they get purged, purged of their, uh, you know, impurity so they can get into heaven. Any place. Depends who you listen to, any time from a couple hours to a few thousand years, depending how bad you've been. Yeah. But it's not biblical because the sacrifice of Christ was complete. He did everything. If you believe in a purgatory, that means you have to earn your own salvation or work for it. Right. He said it's finished. He did it all. We just That's believe right. what he has done. Plus the fact that, you know, if, we're, if we believe in a purgatory, we're saying that, uh, again, not only Christ didn't finish the work, but it's literally up to us to get to heaven. And if there's one thing, Greg, as you know, as you preach... We can't do anything to please God. All we can do is believe because our works are, you know, filthy rags. Our righteousness is that way. So purgatory is a place, again, a non-existent place that denies the sacrifice of Christ was sufficient. That uh, basically was used money to get from the people of the church to pray their relatives out of there. Because if you're in purgatory, you can't do anything for yourself. Your relatives here have to do it for you. So that's where they can pay money, have masses, prayers by the priest to get you out of there. But it just doesn't exist. One person asked this question. Uh, well, we know our loved one's in heaven. My daughter passed away mm-hmm. as a baby. Oh, or uh, will she still be a baby? And will she know I'm her mommy? Will she know her siblings? Will I know my husband? Yeah. That's sweet. It's Isn't sad. that wonderful? Yeah. yeah. First Corinthians 13 says, we will know even as we are known. Yeah. In other words, our knowledge will be full. It was the great preacher G. Campbell Morgan that was asked the question, Dr. Morgan, will I know my loved one's in heaven? And he said, ma'am, I don't expect to be a bigger fool in heaven than I am here on the earth. And I certainly know who my loved ones are here on the earth. So, yeah, yeah, of course we will. 
She also asked an interesting question. So if a baby dies, yeah. or do they remain a baby in heaven? Uh, no, probably not. We'll probably all be, you know, again, we don't age in heaven, so we'll be all mature in heaven. Now, yeah. what we'll look like in that, the, the age that we'll be at, you know, we won't age as it were, but no, we'll all be, you know, very similar that yeah. way, but we'll know each other. Just think of the transfiguration, right. Greg. Uh, Moses and Elijah showed up. There wasn't any receiving line. They'd have a T-shirt that right. said, Moses, I'm Elijah. Hi, welcome here. You know, one of that, yeah. they just knew. And it's kind of like that. Do you think in the glorified state, everyone will be bald like I am? Uh, <laughs> be careful I answer that. Will we? <laughs> I, I, Don't well, answer I, it. I, will. I, I had a couple of lines, but I won't use them. <laughs> you know, I think when you lose a loved one unexpectedly yeah. Yeah. or even expectedly, you know, you have no way to mentally prepare for what that's no. like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I know a person who just lost a loved one and, and she, they were doing really well in the immediate aftermath. And I thought, you know, hard days are coming yep. for me because the reality that. sets in and that person's no longer there. Even if you knew they were going to die, even if they were on their yeah. deathbed, yeah. when they're finally gone, it's so hard. And this, uh, the result of this is sometimes people try to have communication with people on the other side. Uh, you'll even hear things said like, well, I know my loved one is still with me. I, I sense their presence yeah. or, or even something like they, they speak to me and they guide me. Oh, why is this a dangerous thing for anyone to yeah. do, much less a Christian? Yeah, you can't reach your loved one. The loved one is beyond your reach. If you reach anybody, it certainly won't be your loved one there. Uh, once, we're, once a person is dead, they're in the unseen realm, and they cannot come back. They don't come back and haunt. They don't come back and communicate. Not at all. And the Bible gives the strongest of warnings in Deuteronomy 18. Don't learn the way of the heathen, which they yeah. try to do, is communicate with the dead. Because we won't. We will talk to somebody, but it certainly won't be that dead relative we're talking yeah. to. They can't tell us what's going on because the Lord Jesus has given us enough. In fact, Greg, 2 Corinthians 12, Paul was you know, caught up into heaven. Yeah. He wasn't allowed to say anything. Yeah. Uh, he said he doesn't even know if he's in the body or out of the body, so we better be very careful about trying to do something like that. Exactly right. Now, we've talked about what happens to a Christian when they die and what happens to a non-Christian uh, when they die. Yeah, read Luke 16, 19 to 31, and you find out what happens to a non-Christian. There's an account Jesus gave of a rich man who was, did very well in this life and who died, who was conscious, who was in torment, he knew who he was. He knew who Lazarus, the poor man, was. He right. knew who Abraham was. He knew he had five brothers. He knew where he was. He was conscious. He was conscious. He knew why he was there. He yeah. was in flame. He was in torment. And yet he knew he couldn't get out of it. And he knew he had the chance to believe in this lifetime. But then he was told no one can come back and, even, and, and talk to somebody on the other realm. So he was stuck there. And, you know, his whole life he could think for all eternity and regret what he did or what he didn't do. Yeah. And, you know, I think that sometimes people will, will think that, uh, well, there's chances after death, but there are no chances yeah. after death. Hebrews 9.27, one death per person, then comes the judgment. Yeah. And so after death comes judgment, and then, of course, eventually the resurrection of the dead. Resurrection, then judgment. And coming back to what you said about, uh, what Jesus said about Lazarus and the rich man, you know, some will say, well, that's a parable. But what's interesting is he uses a name, Lazarus. Yeah, He, he didn't use names in parables. Uh, never. And also, the, all the parables were about this life. This story is about the next life. Yeah. Uh, again. True. Yeah. And even if, let's say, for sake of argument, was a parable, Jesus gave all these specific yes. details. Do you think he gave them to mislead us of what the yeah. afterlife is like? I right. don't think so. Right. I think he wants us to know what's going on there. And he, remember, Greg, he said there's a great chasm, a great gap between those believers and those who are unbelievers. Yeah. And you can't cross over one to the other side. It's like a behind-the-scenes look at Correct. the afterlife, and yep. it's, it, it's not pretty. The that's curtain why, was pulled back, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why we want to believe in Jesus now. Okay, let's shift gears. We're almost done here. I'm going to ask you some personal questions, okay. Don Stewart. Uh, what's your favorite Bible verse? You probably have a lot, but yeah. if you had to pick one, what's your favorite? I, when I am at, there's two of them. Can I have two? Yes. Okay. When I ha I'm asked to write in a Bible, yeah. I write 2 Corinthians 5, 7, and that is, says this, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, yeah. so the excellency of the power may be from God and not from us. In other words, we're just clay pots. Yeah. The, any power we have is from God. And my favorite one is 1 Samuel 2, 30, where the Lord says, I will honor those that honor me. Wow. And that was from the movie, remember, Chariots of Fire yes, that was, was used. And I just, that one has always met. If we honor him, he'll honor us. And if we can remember that, life will be a whole lot better and a lot That's easier. Right. Amen. Yep. So here's, um, here's a profound question. What's your favorite kind of food, Don Stewart? Uh, <laughs> I'm working on a diet right now. Oh, you uh, are? Okay, yeah, I'm trying, yeah. 
okay, I'm not. Uh, I actually wrote a book called "I'm Going on a Diet Tomorrow and Other Lies We Tell Ourselves." <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. I, you know, I'm one of these people. As you, I've traveled everywhere. I'll eat what's put in front of me. Yeah. I don't really care. I don't have. A we meet at a Mexican restaurant. We do. I like that that place we meet at. It's yeah, good. That, that's good food there. So Are you gonna pay for it sometime? One day. Oh, one day. Yeah. That's my resolution. Okay, here's the biggest <laughs> he question I have for you. Okay. Why do you like cats? Okay. Because you have a cat. No, no. You post pictures of your cat, or you've sent me pictures of we your have. cat. In fact, you sent a picture of your white cat. Yes. And he would, had my book, Red, The Color of Christmas, oh, which right. was white and red, and the, like the cat was reading it. And I just looked at it and thought, why would you have a cat? First, okay, a couple points. First of all, I don't have one cat. I have five cats. Oh, my. Okay, number one. Okay. Ooh. Two rabbits. We're about to get a dog. We have rabbits, too. Yeah. We're getting, we're getting a Pomeranian. We're going to get a dog, too. Oh, wow. Yeah, and we got outside cats we feed, uh, striped wow. cats. They're called skunks. We feed them. You're and this close to being weird, you know. No, I know. Well, look, <clears throat> my wife and I, we really love animals, nature yeah. and all that. We like doing that. Does, do any of your cats come when you call them, like, here, kitty, kitty, the, do the, they come? Yes, the white one, the one that loves you. The See, one I that like cats like that. Yeah, that if one If the will. cat will come to me, I like the cat. If you come to my house, that cat will greet you and will sit in your I want to meet this cat. Yeah, okay. Well, What's she, that cat's name? Vanilla. Do you feel embarrassed as a man having a cat named Vanilla? My youngest daughter named her. I didn't. Yeah. Okay. So, I know how that is. My grandkids named their cat. They have a rabbit. They named him Fuzzy. Yeah. Then they had a rat <laughs> named Strawberry. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. These hey. names they come up with. Yep. Okay, now, this is a little more serious. I, I will bring this to a close. If you were going to give one last sermon, you, you know, only one sermon, you had to pick a text, yep. and this is your final message, what would your text be, and what would your message be? No question about it. It's actually the first sermon I ever gave when I was starting to preach, and that was from 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul's swan song, the last words mm, he gave to Timothy, yes. where he said, I fought the fight, I have kept the faith, I have finished the course. Now there lays up for me a crown in heaven, not for me only, but also to those who yes. love his appearing. And I would look at the audience, I would say this, have you fought the fight? Have you finished the course? Is there a crown laid up for you? There will be if you trust Christ. And it would be what Paul's last words were, knowing he was about to die, his swan song, his dying declaration. That is exactly what I would preach. Wow. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good question to actually end on, Don, to yep. ask that question to okay. the folks here, the folks listening. Okay. Uh, do you know that you would go to heaven? How can a person know with certainty that they can say like Paul in that final day, I fought the good fight, I kept the faith, I finished the course. Uh, what do they have to do in this life to be sure they'll make it not just to the next life, we're all going to go to the other side. There is an afterlife for everyone, but what do we need to do to make sure we go to heaven and not end up in hell? 1 John 5, 12 and 13 says, those that have the Son of God have life. Those that don't have the Son of God do not have life. Then John said in 5.13, These things have I written that you might know that you have eternal life if you believe in the name of the only begotten Son. It's not a hope so. It's not a think so. It's a know so because God's word says so. So that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's somebody, there's somebody here maybe visiting for the first time or someone listening that's never heard this before. And they hear you say, whoever has a son has life. What does it mean to have the son? Very simple, to acknowledge Jesus Christ as God the Son who died in our place, who died for our sins, to believe in him, to believe we can't make it to heaven on our own, that he has done everything in our, our place, and all we have to do is accept it, reach out and accept that free gift and believe in him because he's done all the rest. Amen. Let's thank Don for coming tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Thanks for having me. Don will be... Um, Don will be signing uh, some of his books after the service, but I would just like to just close with those thoughts that Don was just sharing about having the Son of God in your life. You know, you can't be born a Christian. You have to be born again. That's what Jesus said. And we're all separated from God by our sin. Now, granted, some of us may sin more than others, but one sin's enough to keep you out of heaven. And that's why God sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us because he and he alone was uniquely qualified to satisfy the righteous demands of God. And he died in our place, and he grows again from the dead. And now he stands at the door of every one of our hearts, and he knocks. And he says, if you'll hear my voice and open the door, 
I will come in. You know, being a Christian isn't being a religious person. Frankly, I don't want to be a religious person. I'm not interested in religion. Being a Christian is a relationship with God, with Christ living inside of you. And I ask you tonight, do you have that relationship with him? You say, well, I think maybe I do, Greg. You know what? If Christ lives in you, you'll know. And if you don't know, maybe he doesn't. So why don't we get that resolved right now? He's just a prayer away. And I would like to close our time together by giving you an opportunity to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin so you can know that you'll be ready uh, for eternity. And so if the Lord comes for us, you'll be ready to be caught up in the air to meet him. And you won't have to face this tribulation period that we've been talking about, these horrible times that are coming for planet Earth. But maybe even he doesn't come in your lifetime. If death comes sooner than you expect it, it is going to come to everyone. But when it comes, you don't have to fear it because you know God in a personal way. But if you've not asked Christ to come into your life, you can do it right now. And we're going to pray and give you an opportunity to believe in Jesus. So let's all just bow our heads for a moment. And Father, I pray for any person here, any person watching or listening that does not know you, I pray, Lord, that you will help them to see their need for you and help them to come to you and believe and be forgiven of all of their sins. Now while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying together, how many of you would say tonight, Greg, I want to go to heaven when I die. I want to be sure I'll get there. I don't want to go through the tribulation period. I want to be ready for Jesus when he calls his people home. I want to be one of those Christians caught up to meet the Lord in the air, pray for me. I'm ready to say yes to Jesus. If that's your desire, if you want Christ to come into your life, if you want him to forgive you of your sin, if you want to go to heaven when you die, would you raise your hand up right now? And I'd like to pray for you. God bless you. Anybody else? Raise your hand up or I can see it. And I'll pray for you. God bless you as well. Anybody else? Just raise your hand up. God bless you too. God bless you. Anybody else? Raise your hand now. Just raise it up. God bless you. See you over there. Yes, amen. Just raise your hand up. God's Holy Spirit is speaking to you tonight. Don't ignore him. The Bible says, harden not your heart if you can hear his voice. Anybody else? You want to get right with God. You want your sin forgiven. You want to go to heaven. You want this relationship with God. Raise your hand up. I'll pray for you. God bless you as well. Anybody else? Raise your hand now. I'll pray for you. All right. God bless you up here in the front. Now I'm going to ask all, God bless you there too. I see you behind the camera there. I'm going to ask all of you, if you would please, that have raised your hand, I want you to just stand to your feet and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Stand up if you just raise your hand, even if you didn't raise your hand, but you want Christ to come into your life. You want him to forgive you of your sin. You want to be ready for his return, just stand up and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. God bless you that are standing. So if you stand, you're not alone. Others are standing. Anybody else? Stand now. You want to get right with God. God bless you. I'll wait another moment. Anybody else? Stand now. Let me lead you in this prayer. This will be the greatest moment of your life as you ask Christ to come in. Anybody else? Stand up and we'll pray together. I'll wait one more moment. Just stand now. Anybody else? God bless you. Anybody else? Stand now. All right. You that are standing, I want to pray this prayer, and I would ask you to pray it out loud after me. And in this prayer, you're asking Jesus to come into your life. Again, as I pray, pray this out loud after me, okay? Pray this out loud after me now. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. But I know that you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin and rose again from the dead. Jesus, come into my life. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Be my God. I choose to follow you from this night forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. God bless all of you. All right. Praise the Lord. Oh, thanks, Jack.